Hey, it's Amy with Behind the Tweet. You've seen me post a link to a couple studies which show that supporting the immune system in chronic inflammatory disease may be a new future for treating a lot of chronic inflammatory conditions. That's something that I've pioneered in most of my papers starting back at the first paper I ever wrote. I'm really excited that this is a new potential paradigm moving forward in medicine. But in order for you to better understand where I'm coming from and to understand why I think this is an important potential treatment paradigm shift, I want to address a few topics um, before that. And today I'd like to talk a little bit about pathogen triggers versus persistent pathogens as drivers or contributors to chronic inflammatory disease. I frequently still see a reference to what is referenced as a pathogen trigger model for a chronic inflammatory condition. Uh, sometimes it's called a hit and run model. And that's based on the fact that in these models, a pathogen, a serious pathogen infects a person and then somehow, and this is the part I don't understand. I'm going to go ahead and say that I don't understand or follow a trigger mechanism for chronic inflammatory disease. And part of why I don't understand that is that in this model, a pathogen comes in and somehow dysregulates the human immune system in a way that's so profound that the patient develops some sort of immune or metabolic disease that lasts the rest of their lives. However, this dysregulated immune system somehow eradicates or gets rid of the pathogen driving that, that triggered the dysfunction so that pathogen is no longer in the body. So basically somehow a pathogen causes a problem, triggers it, then leaves, and the patient remains sick for the rest of their lives. I struggle to understand the mechanisms behind how this is possible. As a microbiologist, I've studied a lot of pathogen behavior, and I don't understand how a pathogen can do something in the body that can trigger a disease in the absence of its presence. So for example, as an analogy, the hit and run model, or this pathogen trigger model, is a little like saying, um, it rained today. There was a giant black rain cloud out there. And so there's this downpour of rain that's affecting our, our community. However, after the rain cloud left and completely moved away, it continued to rain on this same area for the rest of time. I wouldn't be able to understand how that was possible. How can it rain when the cloud is no longer there? The same thing happens with the hit and run model for um, disease. I don't understand how a symptoms can progress in the absence of the pathogen that drives them. And I may be wrong on this. There may be a, a mechanism. When I mean mechanism, I'm talking about the molecular biology understand, uh, underlying how that's possible. What I mean is I would love to see someone be able to tell me how a pathogen can do this. Does it somehow um, bind DNA? Does it mutate something? I'm trying to look for a mechanism by which this is possible. And I've done extensive reviews of the literature and I have not been able to find a solid mechanism. What I do find is thinking along these lines, which is usually when someone tells me about a pathogen trigger hypothesis, they'll say, ah, yes, well, we're not really sure how that would work, but you know, the body is a mysterious thing and we, we really don't know what it's capable of doing. So this might be possible. And that, at this point, is not enough evidence for me. So I think some of you know the movie Jerry Maguire, Cuba Gooding Jr. says, show me the money. I say, when it comes to the hit and run model for infection and chronic inflammatory disease progression, show me the mechanism. And I really mean that. If someone out there has a mechanism for how this can happen and they think I need to understand it, I would love to better understand that. Please let me know. I'm willing to adjust my thinking on this topic. I just simply can't follow it today, to this day in 2018. What I can follow is that persistent infectious agents can drive chronic inflammatory disease processes. Now, I understand how the hit and run model might have been developed and pushed forward when the body was considered to be sterile. If the body is sterile and there's no microbe ecosystem communities in the human body, well, it's very hard to explain how a pathogen causing an illness could persist in the human body in this apparently sterile body and drive disease processes. So I think the hit and run model stems from an era in which the body was believed to be largely sterile. Well, now we know that the opposite of that is true. As I've emphasized in these videos, in my papers, everywhere, 
the body is now understood to harbor a vast and extensive microbiome, not just in the gut, but a microbiome that extends to almost every single part of all human tissue and blood. There are communities of bacteria in these communities. There are bacterial communities. There are viruses in these communities. I talked about the virome in my last video. We're talking about trillions of viruses in human tissue and blood. There are fungi in these communities. Archaea, parasites make up these communities. That's an important point. All of our microbiome communities contain pathogens and potential pathogens in them. So when it comes to pathogens impacting a chronic inflammatory condition, in 2018, now that we know that the body is not at all sterile, it makes much more sense that an infecting pathogen driving a disease process would persist in the body and become a member of our microbiome ecosystem communities. It would integrate into, it doesn't matter, and maybe into the gut microbiome, maybe into the lung microbiome, maybe on the skin microbiome. It can integrate and become a persistent member of our microbial ecosystems. Now, if that was the case, now there are plenty of very clear mechanisms by which that pathogen can drive disease. That pathogen can simply drive chronic inflammation. The immune system will react to that pathogen. We're gonna see activated immune cells and persistent chronic inflammation. Antibodies may also be generated in response to that persistent pathogen. These would not be autoantibodies. These would just be regular antibodies generated in response to a pathogen that may or may not then go ahead and target human tissue, but originally created in response to a pathogen. The pathogen can persist inside the cells of the immune system, inside a person's white blood cells that are supposed to actually be killing pathogens. A pathogen that can persist in that fashion can actually, because it's inside a human cell, it can actually interfere with human DNA expression, transcription, translation processes that affect how our human DNA is expressed and how it's encoded. A, a pathogen and its proteins and metabolites can literally interfere with all those human processes as long as it's able to persist inside a human cell. Most of the pathogens, most of the well-studied pathogens that we know are connected to chronic inflammatory conditions, like Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus, the herpes viruses, you name it, they're all capable of intracellular persistence. They all actually tend to persist and do exactly what I'm talking about. Now, there is a mechanism. What this means then is that we need to be more accepting of the fact that most pathogens driving a disease process have not left us alone. They have not triggered the illness. They're in our bodies where they are continuing to drive the condition. There are a couple impediments that still keep people from, I think, fully accepting this to be true. One of them is that often a pathogen that might be causing an illness is hard to detect on a blood test. Um, and that is because most of our blood tests in a doctor's office have no ability to pick up on the vast majority of microbes in the human body. They only search for about sometimes five out of the thousands of microbial and viral species that are capable of persisting in the human body. So there's nothing, you cannot go to a doctor. When you go to a doctor now, your doctor cannot test to see what's in the virome. It can, they cannot test to see the composition of your microbiome in a single visit. Maybe they can do like a, a small gut microbiome thing if you order a test through a, through a company, but that's hardly uh, an approximation of being able to understand the persistent microbes in your body. So what we need to do is we need to expand the testing that we use on patients to better be able to pick up on persistent microbiome pathogens. Another thing that distracts people is that often it appears that when a pathogen persists in a latent or chronic form that drives persistent and chronic symptoms, the pathogen may no longer be easily detected in the blood of that patient. I wanna give you a couple examples. So there was recently um, a study that I really found interesting on Zika virus. And it was a team who looked at Zika in, in monkeys. And they were looking at Zika's ability to persist in these monkeys and not just drive the acute um, symptoms that happen when Zika first infects a patient or a monkey, but they were looking at Zika's ability to persist in the body and drive chronic symptoms. So when they did this, they did find that Zika was capable of persisting in infected monkeys for months after the virus had been cleared from their mucosal secretions, their peripheral blood, and their urine. 
the virus was no longer found there, but the team did find the virus when they looked in the cerebral spinal fluid and the lymph nodes of these monkeys. So in this case, they had to do special testing that acknowledge the fact that latent forms of different pathogens may persist in different areas of the human body that are also no longer sterile. Um, a similar uh, phenomenon has happened with Ebola. There's actually a condition now called post-Ebola syndrome in which people, a number of people who have survived acute Ebola infection go on to develop serious chronic symptoms. A lot of them are, are bad neuro symptoms, severe pain really bad chronic symptoms. Well, there's been a lot of testing on these patients and they struggle to find Ebola in the blood of these patients with the chronic symptoms. However, two or at least two research teams have been able to detect Ebola in men's semen in some of these cases, in these chronic cases, for up to two years after the virus was no longer found in their blood. Again, the virus was persisting in an area of the body that we often don't even think to look at. And you know, I actually read um, the other day a really good study on persistent Borrelia. Um, the team looked at 12 patients with chronic Lyme symptoms, and they, they, they did a ton of testing. They did microscopic testing. They did molecular testing. They actually had their samples looked at by three separate labs, neither of which lab knew the other lab was looking at the samples so that they would, have, they would be completely unbiased in the way they interpreted the data. And all of the, of the separate labs found basically the same outcome, which was in the patients with these chronic Lyme disease symptoms, Borrelia spirochetes were identified and cultured from the blood of seven subjects, but from the genital secretions of 10 of the subjects and from skin lesions of one subject. So there we go. Maybe we can't always find evidence of the infecting agent just in the blood. We're going to have to look at genital secretions. We're going to have to look at skin lesions. There's a similar, uh, similar trend, I would say, in a study in which um, an MECFS researcher looked at enterovirus infection in the gut. And for years um, after developing the condition MECFS, um, he found that you could not find enterovirus um, presence of the virus on any kind of blood test. But when he did stomach biopsies on patients with the condition, he was able to find the virus via these biopsies. Again, specific tests that are able to better look for latent forms of these microbes. We need to work on this. So that, that's the last thing. Because I want to give you one example of, um, of what we've accepted as being a pathogen that stays in the body and drives chronic symptoms. I would like to suggest that we look at most pathogens and their ability to drive chronic symptoms the way we look at herpes and genital herpes. I think this is just something we're all familiar with, so I'm going to use this as, as an example. Let's say um, through sexual contact, sexual intercourse, someone um, gets infected with HSV1 or HSV2, one of the herpes viruses. We don't go on to say that that virus has triggered herpes. We tell that patient that they now harbor that herpes virus for the rest of their lives and that that herpes virus, well, we should tell them that herpes virus now persists as a member of their microbial microbiome ecosystems. It's a member. It's part of the body's communities now. Now, that virus that is persisting in that person may occasionally cause that person to have flares of symptoms chronic symptoms, genital symptoms that flare up and down over the course possibly of the rest of their life, but the pathogen is there. We don't tell someone that they got triggered by a herpes, genital herpes infection, the pathogen went away, and they are somehow going to have genital symptoms for the rest of their lives. One of the reasons we're comfortable with accepting that genital herpes is caused by a persistent virus that causes chronic symptoms by staying in a patient to do so is because we're actually able to detect the herpes viruses fairly well on standard blood tests. So that's become more accepted. I'd like to argue then that most infecting pathogens likely persist as members of our microbiome ecosystems if they cause chronic symptoms. And we need to take the opportunity to better understand, we need to better uh, create blood tests and study protocols that better search for these pathogens in their chronic persistent forms. And yet again, that may mean that a hit and run model for infection in which a pathogen infects a patient and then leaves 
that may no longer really hold up in the era of the human microbiome. That may be a paradigm that made more sense when the body was sterile, but is not necessarily the best explanation for chronic symptoms in 2018. That is my point today. Um, next behind the tweet, or in one of them, I will begin to talk a little bit about the theory of autoimmunity. I think we need to reevaluate the classical theory of autoimmunity to account for some of the possibilities I actually just brought up in this conversation. Talk then. Bye.